so much. My name is Richard Gage, AIA. I've been a practicing architect for 20 years, and I'm a member of the American Institute of Architects. Tonight, we're presenting to you the technical truths, the evidence found for the explosive demolition of all three World Trade Center high-rise collapses on 9-11, the iconic Twin Towers and the mysterious Building 7. This is a controlled demolition. Let's focus on this type of destruction first. We have hundreds of examples from all across the country from which to make our comparison because it's the most commonly used method to demolish high-rises. This is what a high-rise looks like when it's being demolished with explosives. Let's take a look at some of the key characteristics of controlled demolition. First, we have a sudden onset of destruction at the base of the structure. We have straight down symmetrical collapse into its own footprint. Because demolition waves remove the column support, resulting in a free fall speed, virtually, through the path of what was the greatest resistance, thousands of tons of structural steel. We have a total dismemberment of the steel structure, so it's ready for shipment. We have minimal damage to adjacent structures, sounds and flashes of explosions heard and seen by witnesses, enormous clouds of pulverized concrete, squibs sometimes, explosive charges that go off at the wrong times, chemical evidence of cutter charges. These are all fairly typical, and they go to show us direct evidence of explosive destruction. Now, the interesting thing is that not one of these typical characteristics of controlled demolition can be explained or accounted for by fire, let alone all ten of them. Typically, we'll have government documentation, expert corroboration, foreknowledge, and video documentation, all of which supports the hypothesis of controlled demolition, providing proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Let's take a look at World Trade Center 7 now. It was 47 stories tall, what would have been the tallest building in 33 of our states. It was not hit by an airplane. It was the third World Trade Center high-rise to collapse on 9-11 at about 5.20 in the afternoon. Here we have the 12th and 13th floor fires and the 7th floor fire on the north side of the building, the opposite side of the building that was being pelted by the North Tower. Now let's take a look at the evidence of World Trade Center 7 and see how it stacks up against the typical features of a controlled demolition, starting with, is there a sudden onset of destruction? Let's listen to this emergency word. We were watching the building actually because it was on fire, the, uh, the bottom floors of the, the building were on fire, and uh, you know, we heard this, this sound, it sounded like a clap of thunder. Turned around, we were shocked to see that the building was, uh, uh, well, it looked like there was um, a shock wave uh, ripping through the building, and the windows all uh, busted out, and, you know, it was, it was horrifying. And then, uh, you know, about a second later, the bottom floor caves out, and uh, the building followed after that, and um, we saw the building crash down all the way to the ground. A sound of a clap of thunder, a shock wave ripping through the building, and windows busting out, and then the building coming down. Do we have a straight down symmetrical collapse into the building's footprint? Let's listen to Dan Rather narrate this collapse for us as we take our first look at the collapse of Building 7. And what you're seeing are high shots. Now, here we're going to show you a videotape of the collapse itself. Describe that. Now we go to videotape the collapse of this building. It's amazing. A, a amazing, incredible, pick your word. For the third time today, it's reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed, destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down. Let's take a look in this side-by-side -side comparison with a known controlled demolition on the right. Did the building fall into its own footprint? Pretty much so. Do we have demolition waves? And how do these remove the column support? Well, here's a floor plan of Building 7. Now, to bring a building smoothly, symmetrically, into its own 
footprint without falling over, what we have to do is remove the core columns because what we want to do is bring the outside of the building in on itself. Now this involves a high degree of precision that fire is not capable of. Do we have a free fall speed of collapse through the path of greatest resistance? You can see second by second the building gaining downward momentum. You can plot the drop distance on a graph of time and it fits the free fall curve almost perfectly. What does this mean? That the columns had to have been removed and removed virtually simultaneously on each floor, synchronistically timed, so the building had no resistance virtually on the way down. Do we have a total dismemberment of the steel structure? We had a 47-story skyscraper compressed to four stories. Do we have sounds of explosions, though? How about Kevin McPadden? This was a boom, and like you felt a rumble in the ground, like almost like you wanted to grab onto something. That, to me, I knew that was an explosion. There was no doubt in my mind. Do we have enormous clouds of pyroclastic smoke from the pulverized concrete? Watch the concrete entrained in the air racing down every street in each direction at 35 miles an hour. Do we have pools of molten iron? Let's start with the South Tower now. This section applies to the World Trade Center Twin Towers and Building 7. We're told by NIST that this substance must be melted aluminum from the airplane. But Melted aluminum looks like melted aluminum. <laughs> it's silvery. It doesn't uh, glow in daylight conditions. What do the first responders and the demolition contractors say about molten metal? Saw pools of literally molten steel. Molten metal beams had just been totally melted. It was dripping from the molten steel. Steel flowed in molten streams. They're finding molten steel. And this structural engineer, Abu Hazan Astani from Berkeley, cites and documents, I saw melting of girders in the World Trade Center. One of the more unusual artifacts to emerge from the rubble is this rock-like object that has come to be known as the meteorite. It's this fused element of, of steel, mo molten steel and concrete and all of these things all fused by the heat. And architects, engineers, people who work with steel, welders have just never seen the level of destruction and the level of deformation of this material in our lives. What's the problem with that? Office fires, Eager says uh, 1,200 degrees. Uh, NIST claims 1,800 degrees, for which we have no evidence for office fires of that temperature in the Trade Center towers. Structural steel doesn't even begin to melt until 2,700 or so degrees. We're missing 1,000 to 2,000 degrees of temperature, heat energy required to produce this stuff. Where is it coming from? We'll be taking a look at a possible suspect, thermite, which reaches temperatures of 4,500 degrees. Let's listen to John Gross, lead engineer of NIST, tell us about the molten metal from his perspective. First of all, let's go back to your basic uh, premise that there was uh, a pool of molten, molten steel. Um, I know of absolutely nobody, and no eyewitness who has said so, nobody who's produced it. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel. Like molten bit. steel running down the channel rails. Like you're in a foundry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like lava. Like, like, like lava. Volcano. No eyewitness who has said so. There actually melted beams where it was molten steel that was being dug out. No eyewitness who said so. Underground, it was still so hot that molten metal dripped on the sides of a wall. No eyewitness who said so. The piece of metal that's draped over was molten metal. No eyewitness who said so. Saw pools of literally molten steel. Nobody who's produced it. It's this fused element of, of steel, mo molten steel. Nobody who's produced it. Nobody who's produced it. Nobody who's produced it. NASA pictures, thermal images showed those sorts of temperatures in the basement. What is the problem here? Somebody's lying 
I'm going to leave it up to you to make your own conclusions. How about chemical evidence, though? What produced all this molten metal? And what is thermite anyway? Thermite. An incendiary used by the military, thermite is a compound of iron oxide and aluminum, which when ignited sustains an extreme heat reaction, creating molten iron. In just two seconds, thermite can reach temperatures over 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit, quite enough to liquefy steel. Dr. Stephen Jones performed chemical analysis on the previously molten metal. He sent a sample from this 40-pound chunk of previously molten metal from one of those meteorites. He finds that it's predominantly iron, so we can rule out aluminum from the jet plane. It has small amounts of aluminum, sulfur, and potassium, and manganese and fluorine in abundance. Manganese is from the potassium permanganate, commonly used as an oxidizer in thermite. Fluorine is also used in sol gel type thermite charges. So these appear to be the thermite fingerprint. Gel explosives are a super thermite, tiny aluminum particles in iron oxide in this sol gel. They can be cast into shape. They're like a clay. Lawrence Livermore Lab did research on this. If sol gels were used, they would leave behind a very unique signature, 1,3-diphenylpropane. Uh, and in fact, EPA finds one molecule in their toxicological studies at levels that dwarfed all others, 1,3-diphenylpropane. Eric Schwartz says we've never observed it in any other sampling we've ever done. But is there evidence of thermite in the World Trade Center dust? Dr. Jones received no less than four separate samples of World Trade Center dust, some of it from Jeanette McKinley's apartment across the street, where the windows blew in and filled her apartment with dust. Another sample was found uh, like 10 minutes later on the Brooklyn Bridge. Well, he takes this and he puts a magnet over it, and he finds that there are small particles that come up to the magnet. Some of them are angular, some of them are round. They look like this. In fact, he calculates by the weight of the amount of these spheres that he finds in the dust that there must have been about 10 tons for, the whole, for all of the dust that was available. They're about a sixteenth of an inch in diameter, the largest ones, and most of them, though, are smaller than a human hair. What could produce such an incredible array of microspheres? Well, if you had thousands of cutter charges going off in the columns and beams throughout the building, and they were, they were under this incredible pressure, what you'd see is something like this. Tens of thousands or millions of tiny droplets. What's the shape of those droplets? When a liquid is dispersed like this, its surface tension forms itself into almost a perfect sphere. In the case of molten iron, that those droplets cool and they fall along with the dust everywhere. Well, Dr. Jones concludes that given the mix of trace metals present in these high concentrations uh, in the dust, such as zinc, copper, manganese, and the formation of iron-rich aluminum spheres, it's clear that significant aluminothermic reactions occur and he can reverse engineer this and suggest to us that there must have been in the thermite mix powders of aluminum, iron oxide, copper oxide, zinc nitrate, and potassium permanganate. Well, would there possibly be any unignited thermite pieces in the World Trade Center dust? Indeed, he finds it. It also comes up to the magnet from his dust samples. Many chips. This one, a sixteenth of an inch long, red on one side, gray on the other. The red side is composed of tiny iron oxide particles and, and aluminum. The Lawrence Livermore Lab came out with papers only a year or two ago about this stuff. The particles being so small allow for almost instantaneous ignition between the two chemicals, the aluminum and the iron oxide, producing very explosive results. He continues his study and finds additional chips that are partially ignited with spheres 
embedded in them, indicating that the source of the spheres is, for all intents and purposes, identified very clearly. With Dr. Jones and his small team of scientists, through EDS, XRF, and WDS, identifies the components of these spheres and chips, predominantly iron, along with aluminum, oxygen, silicon, 1,3-diphenylpropane, the results coupled with the visual evidence, he says, at the scene, such as the flowing hot liquid metal, providing compelling evidence that thermite reaction compounds were deliberately placed in both World Trade Center towers and Building 7. These results are documented in a peer-reviewed journal. Now, all of this is direct evidence of explosive destruction in Building 7. We'll come jump back to only Building 7 now. Now, none of these characteristics can be explained by fire, let alone all of them. Let's listen to what FEMA did conclude, because it is interesting. Evidence of a severe high-temperature corrosion attack on the steel, including rapid oxidation, sulfidation, and subsequent intergranular melting. Very interesting. Remember, office fires don't melt steel. What melted this steel? Sulfur formed during this hot corrosion attack on the steel. Here is the intergranular melting documented for all of us. Thank you. Capable of turning a solid steel girder into Swiss cheese, like this former wide flange column from the structural steel in Building 7. Now, they document this very carefully in their Appendix C. The specifics of the fires in World Trade Center 7 and how they caused the building to collapse remain unknown at this time. What? Unknown? The best hypothesis, fire plus random damage, and then complete collapse, has only a low probability of occurrence. How about expert corroboration? How about Danny Jewenko, 27-year controlled demolitions expert? It starts from below. They've simply blown away the columns. It's controlled demolition. A team of experts did this. It's professional work, without a doubt. Building 7, do we have any foreknowledge of its destruction? Listen to these construction workers walking away from Building 7 and this police officer caught on CNN camera. We are walking back. It's a building about to blow up. On flame, debris coming down. And how about Kevin McPadden? What did he say? At the last few seconds, he took his hand off, and you heard three, two, one. Countdown? Does that imply foreknowledge? Do fires bring buildings down? To countdowns? Unlikely. In fact, the BBC announces the collapse 20 minutes before it happened. It's true. Jane Stanley is here announcing it. She says the 47-story Solomon Brothers building close to the World Trade Center has also collapsed. And there it is standing behind her. The BBC apologizes for this grievous error, citing the confusing events of the day. <laughs> but does that make them psychic? Unlikely. I believe we've shown that Building 7 matches all of the features of controlled demolition in the classic sense. Is it likely that Al-Qaeda could have had access to this building, which had to have been one of the most secure outside the Pentagon? If they didn't, then who did? The evidence is even more clear in the case of the Twin Towers. So let's take a look, starting with the sudden onset. And what is the evidence for this, and how is it produced? Produced by these sounds and flashes from the explosion. 118 of these firefighters witnessed sounds and flashes of explosions. Somewhere around the middle of the World Trade Center, there was this orange and red flash coming out. Initially, just one flash. Then it just kept popping all the way around the building. The building had started to explode. It's like on television. They blow up these buildings. It seemed like it was going all the way around, like a belt. All these explosions. Pop, pop, pop. That's when I heard the building coming down. 
saw a brief number of light sources being emitted from inside the building between floors 10 and 15. I saw low-level flashes. We actually heard the pops. You know, you heard the pops of the building. It was blowing out on all four sides. What did these guys experience? We started running. Floor by floor, it started popping out. It was like, it was if, if they had detonated. Dead, yeah, you know, detonated. They were planned yeah. to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. All the way down. How about the news reporters? What do they say? They tend to tell the truth on the first day, and then we don't hear that truth again. What happens to it? Anybody who's ever watched a building being demolished on purpose knows that if you're going to do this, you have to get at the, at the under-infrastructure of a building and bring it down. The entire building has just collapsed as if a demolition team set off. When you see the old demolitions of these old buildings, it My folded God. down on itself and it is not there anymore. I heard a second explosion and another rumble. A huge explosion now raining debris on all of us. We better get out of the way. And all of a sudden, it was this big explosion. There was another big, big explosion. An hour later than that, we had that big explosion from much, much lower. Do you, do you know if it was an explosion or if it was a building collapse? To me, it sounded like it, it, to me it sounded like an explosion, but it was a huge explosion. Chief Albert Turry said that there was another explosion which took place, and then an hour after, there was another explosion in one of the towers here. So according to his theory, he thinks that there were actually devices that were planted in the building. It just went ba-boom, it was like a bomb went off, and another explosion came right from it, just everyone flying. Like, it sounded like gunfire. You know, bang, 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 bang. And then, and then all of a sudden, three big explosions. I was about five blocks away when that, I heard uh, explosions, three thuds. There was a uh, heavy-duty explosion. Again, none of these explosions are a part of the official story. Now, compare these explosions uh, to a known explosion on, on, the, on the left here. Upward Outward arching streamers, pyroclastic volumes of dust, symmetrical display like a mushroom. Does it look like a gravitational collapse to you? Let's look at the North Tower now. What I want to point out to you is that you're going to see some explosions up at the top of the building, curiously enough. And what's going to happen is this entire section is going to telescope such that half of it, its upper half, is destroyed before there's any movement from the jet plane impacts down. Let's take a look. Here's the first evidence of explosion, and then over here, and then the collapsing. Of course, the violent clouds which are emerging even prior to the collapse. We're going to take a close-up look after this second look new fuel source, which very well might be jet fuel that wasn't burned, it's getting new oxygen. Let's take a look now closer up. Right away, we're seeing clouds forming up here. Well, wait, the collapse is supposed to be just down here. But we have asymmetrical damage to this building, right? The plane went in one side, and yet this complete symmetrical uh, collapse, we'll use in quotes from now on, and let's keep going. Unexpected. And there one more time. In terms of how swiftly it Belts, just like the firemen saw, all happened. the way around the building. They came down. The antenna falls Many first before anything else falls, indicating core column damage first. Now take a look at the same tower from the bottom, noting the violence underneath the mushroom cloud. The, the collapse is supposed to be occurring way up here, but down below, as you'll see in this second run, incredible quantities of, of squibs, explosions bursting out. And on the third time, I'd like to direct your attention to this racing series of explosions down the right side in the corner of this building about 40 stories below the collapsing building. It gets painfully obvious after a while, doesn't it? Do we have a straight down symmetrical progression of collapse outside the footprint? We had a 207 foot wide building. FEMA tells us, and you can see in this document, that we have 
a 1,200 foot debris field, equidistant around each tower. Asymmetrical damage, symmetrical distribution, all through the site, in fact, and beyond. Do we have squibs or these mistimed explosions? Some believe that these might be appropriately timed explosions. Whatever. In all the videos of the collapses, explosions can be seen bursting from the building 20 to 30 stories below the demolition wave. Here. 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 And here. Now NIST tells us that these are puffs of air being produced by the collapsing building pushing air down the hoistway like a piston. It's got to come out somewhere, right? Well, first of all, these are not puffs of air. They're pulverized building materials. And they occur at 160 to 200 feet, some of them, per second. These velocities are propelled by explosives. 20, 40, and 60 stories below. How can the piston be producing all of that. These highly focalized, uh, pinpoint accurate, uh, geometrically precise, violent ejections. Do we have a near freefall pace through the path of greatest resistance? The Twin Towers came down in nearly freefall speed. What does this mean? That the columns had to have been removed virtually simultaneously on each floor, synchronistically timed, so the building had virtually no resistance on the way down. Where is the 15-story building that was driving this building down to the ground at freefall speed? In the first two seconds, you saw it reduce half of its mass. It was blown outside. It couldn't have been used to influence the downward progression of the building. In the next two seconds, after four seconds totally, it's destroyed itself. There's nothing crushing the building. It's tearing itself apart at free fall speed. And it's dismembering the steel structure. In fact, the leading edge of these mushroom clouds are full of perimeter columns, aluminum cladding, and other steel. Let's take a look at the South Tower in terms of dismemberment. See what's going on here. South Tower's on your left. It was hit lower by the aircraft. And as you can see, its, it's rapid destruction starts there and it begins to tilt to the left. This building, which is already tilted at 22 degrees and continuing its angular momentum, off center of the building below it. How can it crush it symmetrically at free fall speed when it's already off center? Let's take a look from below though. We have asymmetrical damage and yet there's this symmetrical destruction occurring underneath the cloud all the way around the building like the firemen saw even though this top mass has already fallen over. Do we have a lateral ejection of structural steel? The damage is not contained. Windows are blown from neighborhood buildings. What kind of energy enabled this? Here, a chunk of steel was flung 400 feet, wedging itself deep into Three World Financial Center on Fezzi Street. What about those floors, those pancakes? We're, we're, this is a pancake collapse. We're looking for some pancakes down below. This is a seven-story lobby. There's about two or three stories of stuff in there. We'll take a look at that stuff, but what I'm looking for is 110 floors with this kind of metal decking underneath four and five inches thick of concrete. An acre in size, each of them. 110 acres of these. How many floors do we find down at the bottom? Not 50, not 10, not even one. 
We don't even find metal decking down there or concrete. There's hardly any macroscopic chunks of concrete. What happened to the metal decking? What happened to the concrete? What happened to the concrete? The concrete was pulverized. And I was down here Tuesday, and it was like you were on a foreign planet. All of lower Manhattan, not just this site, from river to river, there was dust powder, two, three inches thick. The concrete was just uh, pulverized. All of this is direct evidence of explosive destruction. And none of it can be accounted for by fire. Do we have expert corroboration? William Rice, structural engineer with architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. The prevailing theory would have us believe that each of the Twin Towers inexplicably collapsed upon itself, crushing all 287 massive columns on each floor while maintaining a free fall speed as if the 100,000 or more tons of supporting structural steel framework underneath didn't even exist. How about David Scott, structural engineer with AE 911 Truth? Near free fall collapse violates laws of physics. This suggests all the features of a classic controlled demolition with those exceptions which are atypical of classic controlled demolition. None of these features can be accounted for by fire, let alone all ten of them. It's proof beyond a reasonable doubt. We've shown here today that explosives were used to destroy each of the three World Trade Center high-rise buildings on 9-11. And it's known that it takes months of planning to set up and engineer and place these explosives. Do we think that Al-Qaeda had access to these highly secure buildings? Thank you so very much for your attention today. Thank you so very much.